Doctors with disabilities exist in small but impactful numbers. How do they navigate their journey? What are the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? And what can we learn from their experiences? Join us as we explore the stories of doctors, PAs, nurses, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and other health professionals with disabilities. We'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that drive medicine forward towards real equity and inclusion. I am Peter Poulos, and I am thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the Docs with Disabilities podcast. In this episode, Dr. Poulos is joined by Dr. Michelle Mead, a professor within the University of Michigan's Departments of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Family Medicine, and a practicing rehabilitation psychologist. Dr. Mead's research focuses on topics such as healthcare disparities, health self-management, and the employment of individuals with physical disabilities. She joins us today to talk about her career journey and some of her recent work. We begin with an introduction from Dr. Mead. My name is Michelle Mead. I have my PhD in rehabilitation psychology from Ohio University. I went to UTMB in Galveston for internship, did my postdoc here at the University of Michigan in clinical rehabilitation psychology, then went to VCU for a job. And then in 2007, I came back here and worked my way up through the ranks again. So I am now a professor in physical medicine and rehabilitation and family medicine. I do research probably about 80% of the time and then a little bit of clinical work outpatient therapy still. I uh, am the co-director of the Center for Disability Health and Wellness, as well as leading a couple national, federal, and private grants. Tell me about your path. How did you get to this point? With a lot of fits and starts. It took me another year to do my internship because the first time going through a PhD program in clinical psychology, they don't always have enough intern spots for everyone, especially those that are accredited. The first time I applied, I didn't get it. So I remember waiting there for the call that never came and that I had to refocus and say, okay, where am I? What do I want to do? How do I support myself for this year? And use that opportunity to dive more in depth to my dissertation and then to get some more work experience before applying again. So that was one of the little stumbles along the way. The following year, I did get an internship at University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston doing rehabilitation psychology. And so previously I'd done health psychology, which is more like the back pain, asthma, management of chronic conditions. So it fit well, but it was a little bit of a different perspective. And so with that, I was doing work with kids with burns at Shriners. I was doing work with adults with burns, a whole range of different issues. And so I did the year and then came out of that with the internship completed with the PhD, but not with a job. And so that was a waiting period too, until the right one came along or until one that seemed to match came along. And so in 1998, I started at uh, the University of Michigan in the rehab psychology department. Okay, I was the inpatient psychologist. There was a lot of on the job learning. There was a lot of just being part of the team, which was great. And, you know, learning a lot during that process. A year and a half later, went to a job that once again didn't work. And so it was like, okay, unemployed again. Got to take a step back. <laughs> what is it that I want to do? And so then I kept on looking for a position saying, okay, so a clinical position, but can I do some research with that? A clinical position, can I do some research? And then finally, I just found a research position that fits so well at Virginia Commonwealth University. 
So I got to uh, then be their director of research for their spinal cord injury model systems down there and jumping into employment. And then I go in and it's like, okay, we're working on employment after spinal cord injury. I've worked on the inpatient unit. I feel good about knowing the different opportunities. We got the health and functioning down, right? And then reading the research and listening to people and saying, no, we don't. There are so many healthcare disparities that exist, so many problems with our healthcare system. And so it was at VCU that I encountered the term healthcare disparities and doing my research down there, which is probably 60% African-American and with, you know, seeing the multiple types of biases and disadvantages that were impacting the individuals down there in the research group and just who were going through that model systems, I knocked on the door of the head of the African-American Studies Program, Dr. Njiri Jackson, and that was one of the best decisions of my life because she was willing to listen. It's like my perspective is limited and I need a partnership. And so she was willing to do that. And so we applied for a grant and we were able to get one. And so it was Dr. Jackson with her political science background, myself in rehab psychology and uh, and, and a physical therapist who was doing survey research and was in the survey research lab down there. And so we did a needs assessment of traditionally marginalized and underserved individuals. Because I was a more of a qualitative researcher, we started the focus group. It's like, yeah, well, I interview 100 people. Um, <laughs> and so I don't think we got quite there, but we got pretty close between uh, caregivers and you know focus groups. Uh, some interviews, primarily individuals with disabilities, a lot of women, a lot of African-American men, different individuals in between. And so it just was really a shift in my career. That was probably one of the defining experiences in terms of listening to people, hearing what their concerns are, hearing my own perceptions of what the healthcare system is and what we do and how we do it, being kind of challenged Mm -hmm. and really thinking and then about the intersectionalities and the additional challenges and issues that come up. So the personal stories that you heard from your patients sounds like those very much motivated you. They did. I mean, between the, you know the females saying that doctors didn't believe they were sexual, and so they thought nothing about referring them for a hysterectomy. To individuals who said, "Well, I can't get birth control because the doctors don't know what to do because the research says that I'm at higher risk, and so they think I don't need it." To issues with you know marriage or losing benefits if you got married to someone. Challenges with doctors and the discriminations and not being recognized or just being seen as drug seeking about the assumptions that, oh, you're an African-American male with a spinal cord injury. You must have gotten shot because you were doing drugs or you were doing the wrong thing, right? And then hearing them say about doctors, you know, I'm trying to find someone to work with me. And just over and over again, they have to stop assuming that I can't take care of myself, but I do need someone who will listen to me, who will figure out how to work with me in my life and who doesn't feel overwhelmed by what's going on, who can really have a partnership. So I talked to a lot of amazing people and I've continued to do that over the years with my own, you know, additional grant funding myself. And then I also partner with Dr. Krauss down in Medical University of South Carolina. He's a PhD with a C34 spinal cord injury. So he's about 50 years post-injury now, I think. You know, it's about listening. And then a sense of also being a clinician, the responsibility, how do we change things? How do we increase awareness about this? What are the mechanisms that we make a difference? I also had the opportunity in the Virginia, when I was down there, had gotten a grant for the health promotions with people with disabilities program. And so those are the CDC grants that have been given out to various states to create a state plan. And so with that, it really broadened my perspective about you can't just focus on one type of diagnosis or disability. I mean, you can for certain things such as medical treatment 
such as rehabilitation and knowing maybe what particular type of expectations are or outcomes or challenges, but that in order to facilitate change, in order to think on a larger public health or systems change perspective, you have to think across disability types. Otherwise, it's too easy to split the, the power of the voices. In the next section, the conversation shifts to consider the value that doctors with disabilities bring to medical spaces and the importance of personal narratives in creating change. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the role of doctors and other healthcare providers with disabilities and what they bring to the medical field. I, I think they're an incredibly important part of the medical field. I think they're an incredibly important part of systems change. And I looked over my uh, job interview presentation to the while ago, which was 2007. And having doctors with disabilities was on the recommendation list that I listed there when I talked about addressing healthcare disparities. Because people need to, once again, be aware of it. They have to be at the table. For most healthcare providers, for most healthcare systems, administrators, I think they come in with bias. And they see individuals with disabilities and they identify them as patients. Mm -hmm. And that is then the role in the hierarchy. You have a disability, but you don't have the information that I have. You are different than me. Rather than here's someone who is experiencing some of the challenges, recognizes or is aware of medical culture and norms and such, and is still there and negotiating. Another thing that struck me about what you said is just the power of narrative. And that's one of the things that motivates us here at the podcast is knowing that narrative is so powerful, both for helping people, for providing asynchronous mentoring, and just for changing hearts and minds. Definitely. I think the other thing is action. Another piece I didn't mention when I was doing my fellowship is I volunteered for vent camp. And so here were the five to 18 year olds who needed a ventilator. And some were individuals with high level tetraplegia who needed a ventilator and some just needed it at night. And yet they were at a camp. They were away from parents. They had a partner, they had medical directors, they had nurses in the camp, but they were kids. They got to go to dances. They, you know, played tricks on each other. The boys and girls cabin, they did hide and seek. They were just allowed to be kids and their level of respect and treatment of one another was wonderful. But more than that, it was really about can people do if they have the real access and types of support that they require? And that is not always a challenge. In the next section, Dr. Poulos and Dr. Mead consider how healthcare providers with disabilities can protect and maintain their mental health while working in an ableist field. How can we with disabilities maintain our mental health in such an ableist system? Recognizing the system, naming it helps. Knowing that in some ways it's not personal, that is there, but I guess grabbing on to that shared brotherhood or that the connection and the community, like other marginalized populations often do as a way of being able to maintain their mental health. Continuing to recognize strengths. You know, one of the things I think I do, whether it's during a focus group or 
my individual sessions is definitely providing a chance to listen, to validate the experiences that are out there, that name it, that, you know, connect it to larger experiences that other individuals are going through, but also help people to realize how much they have. I think a lot of times one of the factors is that the ableism, it makes you self-doubt. It makes you not recognize all they've been working on, the challenges. There's some, once again, some implicit bias, and then there's direct bias, you know, obvious. And you have the same thing with ableism. And a lot of times it's probably those microaggressions, the, the ones where it makes you think, is that me? You know, what am I not doing right? I think providing opportunities for celebrating as well as for discussing the challenges, the microaggressions, the violence that occur, uh, problem solving, and also giving yourself a chance to say, I need a time out because I hear a lot of advocates, uh, people are just tired, they're burned out. And knowing that it's okay to take a break, you know, and that other people are carrying the torch for a while and that coming back together to figure out what's the next step and what can be done. Some of the folks I work with in rehab psychology, you know, are definitely working more on the disability identity aspect of things and recognizing what being an individual with a disability means and taking pride within that. I remember when I was teaching a class at BCU, there was a student in there who was blind. And I was saying, oh, well, it's surprising that the adults here who were blind had the same type of quality of life as individuals who weren't or reported that. And she's like, excuse me? No, it's not. It's a matter of perspective, you know? And you sh shouldn't assume. And I do think increasingly, there's that power of having a community and part of that and part of that acceptance. And so it's being able to come out to, to celebrate with one another and to recognize both the challenges and the joys to accept people's personalities for all their crankiness and, or uh, cheerfulness or anything in between. That sense of, you know, shared reinforcement, shared respect and lifting people up, not in a false way, not in a let me be falsely sweet because you can't bear it, but the sense of respect, both respect that I know the challenges you have to deal with every day and that I know you're a good person, but everyone messes up. And so that's the other piece, being able to call one another on it. In the next section, Dr. Mead shares more about her research interests. I guess I have two areas of research. I do my collaborative work in the area of health and healthcare disparities for individuals with disabilities and at intersectionalities with other marginalized identities. And then I have my uh, more personal research focused on self-management and looking at what are the skills people need? What are the factors that play into those skills? So the psychological aspect of it. So thinking not just on stress management and problem solving, but also communication, attitude, quite a number of the factors there. I sort of went through your bibliography and took a look at some of your recent papers that was just so interesting i was like god i really need to check my email this morning but i don't want to stop reading these articles they're so they're so good so i wanted to talk to you about one published <laughs> this year in um, rehabilitation psychology it was called flourishing after traumatic spinal cord injury results from a multi-method study first of all what is flourishing Flourishing is supposed to be meeting the optimal sense of mental health and well-being. So the idea of doing well, having a sense of purpose in life. So it's not just I'm healthy. It is my life has meaning. 
you know, recently, I think resilience has received a lot of attention as an important contributor. Well, this is from your article, actually. I cut and paste it. Is an important contributor to both positive mental and physical health outcomes for traumatic SCI. The whole idea is, is resilience a stable trait that people grow up with, or are there specific pieces or skills there that can be developed? I think the idea of, you know, pieces like extroversion are really interesting because there's the whole idea of where do you get your energy from. But I do think that interacting with folks in general, people who are more outgoing, who are able to go in there and get themselves to talk to others, do a better job of connecting, of getting social supports. That's how you develop new friendships, you know? And I think that's especially important with a disability that you're going to have to feel comfortable with individuals. You have to say, okay, people, you know, you can't go in already thinking people don't really want to talk to me, which I think a lot of introverts such as myself are there saying, okay, why would they want to talk versus no, people are interesting. You know, why wouldn't they want to talk to me? They want to learn. And having that as a baseline characteristics, I think really helps with then, you know, just dealing with scares, with dealing with people's questions or with asking people for help. It is a more connection-based approach and way of doing things that, you know, I think is especially important when you're living with higher level of impairment that requires support or requires specific assistance. And that whether that's from a caregivers to help with IADLs or just to, you know, get your wheelchair fit, you fell out and it rolled down the hill. You got to feel comfortable saying, excuse me, someone, can you help me? Or can you reach the top shelf there? <laughs> For me, that overlaps with a sense of social support. Is there someone you could call in an emergency? Do you have someone to go to the movie with if you called that night? You know, just the idea of who is in your circle that you know you can count on. And that combination of being extroverted, developing friendships, and being able to have people you can both count on and give things back to. And I think this is one of the pieces with the executive functioning. And I need to follow up with it in future research. So the executive functioning are things like problem solving. It's the flexibility, ability to multitask, but go back and forth between things. And of course, with folks with higher level spinal cord injuries or most spinal cord injury, it's a matter of managing the everyday types of activities as well as getting on with the rest of your life. And so it's constantly the back and forth. The complexities associated with all the areas of management, I think, makes the having or not having significant deficits really important because that then makes it harder. I think it also is tied to that sense of, can I look beyond myself? And that trifecta of having the capacity to not only connect with people and to talk to people, but also to be a friend, to know what's going on in their life, to show respect and value their contributions allows a more healthier friendship, maybe, or healthier connections that really contribute to flourishing quality of life. And I guess for me, the self-management is the sense of, at the end of the day, you got to figure out how to do it, you know? And, and that probably connects with more recent things in focus groups is that it's hard enough living and aging with spinal cord injury that you got to be motivated, you know? <laughs> but you then figure out what you have to work with. And you keep looking at solutions, ways of modifying it. What can be modified? The environment, the, your schedule, your friends, your, you know, how you interact with people, how you think about things. And you go from there. I think one of the things I want to do more work in the future and the intersection probably 
of the self-management and the healthcare disparities is the role of the expert patient. We don't have a specific enough system that recognizes the expertise that folks who have been living with long-term disability or chronic conditions brings to their healthcare. And so they almost have to start over with each healthcare provider proving that they're the expert in their own body or with their own body and with their own lives. The conversation now shifts to focus on another one of Dr. Mead's publications. This paper, titled Ableism and Contours of the Attitudinal Environment as Identified by Adults with Long-Term Physical Disabilities, a Qualitative Study, was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health in June of 2022. You say in that article, as defined by Campbell, ableism is a network of beliefs, processes, and practices that produces a particular kind of self and body, the corporeal standard that is projected as the perfect, species-typical, and therefore essential and fully human. Disability then is cast as a diminished state of being human. And my question is, how does ableism manifest itself in the medical environment for disabled providers and for disabled patients? Uh, so many ways. First of all, let me give proper credit. That paper is primarily the work of my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Lisa Reber, who has her PhD in justice studies. And when she came in to work in my lab, she brought a, that background and a different context into the work. So it's been interesting. But in general, you see it very much in a division, I think, that disability is considered the patient state rather than the state of the provider. I think it fits in with the patriarchal system in terms of individuals with disabilities must not know as much as providers, even about their own life or their own body. They do not have sufficient expertise to make decisions and must just comply with the recommendations that uh, are provided for them. And the failure to do so is considered a deficit and an issue in terms of either a personality disorder or just that they're not trying. I think in general that as a profession, medicine also has that sense of maybe a comparison with the athleticism. You have to both be a sufficient team player and have to stand up to the rigors of that while also being responsible for everything yourself and to meet a higher standard than the rest of the world. That was my attitude before I had my spinal cord injury. Well, I guess in athletics for me, it was bigger, stronger, faster. And in medicine, it was more energetic, coordinated, and able to withstand sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's both, you know, a competitive environment and one in which you're taught if you cannot take it, then maybe you don't belong here. So there's a passage in the article. I'll just read this. So one important context in which structural stigma in the form of beliefs beliefs and policies is manifested as the built environment. So research has provided objective measures of accessibility for the physical environment and the need for more universal design. It has also examined perceptions of the environment by adults with physical disabilities. Less consideration is given to examining the institutionalization of spatial practices and how they influence the reproduction of space. And none focuses specifically on how societal attitude is inferred through the presence or absence of resources and accessibility of the built environment. And previous research has not made the conceptual link between attitude and environment. 
So what is the link between attitude and environment? You have to expect individuals with disabilities to be present in society in order to consider them in how you build a space. And so if there isn't the attitude or expectation that folks of all different types of abilities with various types of disabilities or impairments are going to be working, they're going to be using the bus, they're going to be using the bathrooms, they're going to be parenting and coming into your childcare as thing, they're going to be in the classroom, whether as a student or as a teacher, you're not going to bother or you're not going to consider that with how you design the space. It's a different type of marginalization than race because you can still get in the building if the policies or laws or once the policies and laws allowed you to do so. But if they're stairs, can you? What would it take? But when you go to spaces that are specifically designed, how do you feel? I'm welcome here. There's wide doorways, there's wide hallways, bathrooms are big enough for me and a caregiver to get in. There's an adult changing table that there are, the lights may be dimmed or protected, that there's the track transfer things that goes from one room to another. There's, there's so many possibilities as we create environments and purposely thinking about it, I think is really one of the steps we have to engage in and which takes the DEI concept, you know, to the next step. It's yes, it, it starts with attitudes and it starts with awareness, but then it is implemented in terms of specifically specific policies, supports and changes. As usual, we end this episode with Dr. Mead's advice for listeners. The last question we ask is, what advice would you give to our audience? Connect with people. Find your community. You know, whether it is mentors, whether it's other folks with disabilities, whether it's people who just get it and who recognizes the challenges that you're dealing with and still see you as a whole person and hold you up and recognize your strengths. They don't think you're perfect, but they, uh, they're there to remind you that you're, a good, you're doing important stuff and you're a good person. The other thing is you know, being willing to say no, being willing to recognize people's crap as they're gonna, put you in places that you may not want to go and you figure out, is this strategic or not? And so one of the things in my self-management program is strategic communication, figuring out what you want, where you want to get and how you need to interact with people to get that outcome. To our guest, Dr. Michelle Mead, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We so appreciate your generosity and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today, and we are so grateful for the work you do every day in this field. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We hope you enjoyed this conversation, and we encourage you to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine and Disability Initiative, the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This episode was produced by Lisa Meeks and Sophia Schlossman with support from our audio editor, Jacob Feeman.